I don't have a process that I stick by like a, a set rule book that I say, all right, if I'm creating a character, I'm going to do this, 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 so many different inputs that kind of, then you just kind of see what comes out the other end. And, and hopefully it's, it's something that is good. About the boy. When you're a kid acting, it's more kind of, it's, it's playtime. I mean, it still is as an adult, but you're less kind of going into kind of the technical things that you have at your aid as an actor to kind of disappear into a character. Luckily with that, I mean, obviously the cast in that movie, um, Hugh Grant and Tony Collette and Rachel Weisz and all these people are amazing to work with. So you kind of, acting is always that thing that you're kind of on the same level of anyone else you're doing the scenes with. Um, and also the directors, Chris and Paul Weitz are amazing and, and the writing. So um, that kind of made my job <laughs> as it were, as an 11 year old, pretty easy. I mean, I had sung before, not not on film and not in front of, I think it was 600 people were in the audience um, that day and not with Hugh Grant. It was daunting, it was scary. Um, but I remember all the, everyone was very supportive on the day and encouraging and, um, I mean, it's acting, so there's kind of a way of differentiating it. If, if it was me going out there to try and sing well, um, that would be horrifying. But luckily, it's meant to be a character singing badly. It's definitely occasionally something that people will be like, sing Killing Me Softly for a while, particularly after the movie came out. And I was like, I don't feel I have to do that. I don't have to stand here and a cappella sing <laughs> Killing Me Softly to you. Thanks for the request. Um, uh, and shake your ass, I mean, anytime anyone sings that at me, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm flattered, I guess. Shake your ass, watch yourself, shake your ass. Skin. When I first read Skins, I, I loved the writing, but I originally thought I was more suited to the character of Sid, and, and that was something that I felt like was more in my, in my repertoire, I guess, or something. So, um, when they said that they wanted me to audition to play Tony, I was kind of like, okay, that's not the character that reading the script, I'd instantly gravitate to or think I was right for. I mean, the thing that's great about acting is you get to play different characters and try different genres and different storytelling and all these things. And um, that's certainly what I try and do with each each movie or production or character I play. But um, particularly at that time, I think um, growing up being a child actor to to kind of, I mean, I was only 16 at the time, so I was still a kid, but it's kind of, you still want to appear to be older and, and that was quite um you know a progressive show at the time and, and kind of um very different to all the other teen dramas that had been on up until that point yeah it was definitely a conscious decision and one that luckily paid off um because there was a lot of talented people involved and it kind of i think spoke to that generation the people who were creating skins wanted it to feel authentic and real and that was you know casting people who were the right age and that made you know the cast involved in that show are still some of my best friends so it's kind of this wonderful thing that we were experiencing that point in our, in our lives making the show but then on screen were kind of the right had the right kind of dynamics to be to be pretending to be doing those things i'm just marvelous sydney like hell on earth in here glorious yourself uh yeah yeah i'm all right. excellent vibrant superb so glad to hear i remember doing my first sex scene on on that show um, and obviously that's a scary, weird thing. It's just odd. It's um, Harry Enfield as well was directing the, the British comedian um, who is so well known for his work and, um, and very funny on set. So he made it kind of easier and more relaxing, I guess. And looking back, it was, it, you know, it was kind of odd, but you kind of, it's part of the process of acting. And now I've done plenty of those scenes and, you kind of just get more and more relaxed and used doing them and kind of really try and figure out. I think that experience was very much trying to just get it done, just get it done and, and then move on to the next scene and go back to doing the other acting. Now it's kind of each time one of those scenes comes up in a production, I'm like, okay, well, what are we learning about the characters? What are we trying to say about them by doing this, by showing it? A single man. Yeah, a single man. It was a, it was a fairly fortunate move on my part. Um, there was another actor involved and then and then he couldn't continue the production so so the script got sent my way and um and i loved the script I, I, and, and admittedly i didn't really know much about tom ford at that time i wasn't too savvy on the fashion world um 
so I, I, I did a tape and sent it across and to, to the States and, um, and got a phone call kind of the following evening or something um, saying, hey, can you jump on a plane and, and come meet Tom Ford? He's interested in you for the role. And I was like, brilliant. Um, obviously, I knew Colin Firth and Julianne Moore and was a big fan of their work. And um, I thought this was an incredible story to tell. So I kind of wanted to understand what Tom's motivation was and, and, and sitting and speaking to him. Um, he had such a great understanding of the story and each character involved. And such, I mean, you just sit with him for five minutes and you understand how smart he is and his attention to detail um, and how creative he is as a person. That's one of the the, the lovely outcomes of that movie was um, building that relationship with Tom and um, getting to spend time with him. And then also at the end of the movie, kind of doing the press tour for that um, was around the time that his men's line, I think, was kind of launching. So he, he gave us some beautiful bespoke suits and we got to wear those and it kind of makes you feel incredible to be in them. And, um, and then what, when we were doing press for the movie he asked me to um, be in a campaign for his eyewear as well so we did that um so yeah a really great like partnership and kind of um that was kind of i guess a slight merging of going into the fashion world for me and getting a better understanding of that and kenny was kind of a, quite a mysterious role he was something that you could kind of people could project upon um what their own ideas and feelings were didn't notice you open your mouth once i was watching you you let us ramble on and on and then you straighten us out. You never really tell us everything you know about something. Well, maybe that's true. I had fake tan and highlights. Um, I remember very well being in a hotel in Pasadena and, and Colin and I would um, get our fake tans done in the evening and, and normally have a cocktail whilst we had, had that done and then, um, and then uh, have to uh, uh, ask the hotel to clean the sheets because um, Obviously, fake tan rubs off a lot on white sheets. X-Men first class. I mean, I grew up watching the cartoon of X-Men when I was a little kid. And then the, the original movies came out when I was, I don't know, I think like 10-ish, 9, 10, 11, around there. The opportunity to be a part of those movies. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think superhero movies as such had suddenly become quite such a ginormous event, tentpole type thing that they are now. Um, franchise, I guess. but. Um, but it was certainly something that I loved the X-Men and was excited to be a part of. And um, with Matthew Vaughan directing, I was like, I, I loved his work. And the one odd thing about, I remember about the audition was Matthew Vaughan asked me to, to do a couple of takes like in an American accent as kind of as the character, as you kind of saw the character, but then also do a take um, doing an impression of Stewie Griffin from Family Guy. <laughs> And I'd watched a lot of Family Guy in my teen years growing up. So I was like, okay, I think I've got a pretty good impression of Stewie Griffin lined up. Um, <laughs> and so, so I did like a whole version of the take as Stewie Griffin and sent it off. Um, so maybe that helped me get the part. I don't know. It was just exciting. And again, that character was something I was like, okay, I haven't really done prosthetics work before and make heavy makeup work. So I was interested to see how that would work. And also this Jekyll and Hyde kind of aspect to this character. I mean, I loved the prosthetics um, at first. Um, you know, at first it's hilarious. You put on you, you're the best makeup in the artists in the world are making you look like this completely different um, person and creature. And um, it's amazing as an actor to have a completely different face to then try and act from. And physicality as well, I've got this muscle suit and everything's different. Um, obviously there's there's difficult elements to it. It's, um, it was, you know, it started, started off in the first movie taking roughly three, four hours to go on. Um, and then by the last movie we did, it was only, it was down to about two hours to get on. So it, it sped up a lot the process of getting it on, um, but it was still kind of fairly hot and claustrophobic to work in. So um, that made it tough at times. Um, but overall, I've got, you know, very funny behind the scenes videos and photos and um, had a great time kind of trying to inhabit that character with, with all that happening and, and working with, yeah, really talented makeup artists. So um, yeah, it was a good time. Warm body. Yeah, warm bodies was something that um, occasionally there's been a few scripts that I've kind of read or, or received and, or, ended up being in where I've just read it and gone but something's clicked inside of me and that very much happened with Warm Bodies where I was like okay I think I understand exactly how to do this I found I found the script very funny when I first read it um and sensitive and I kind of uh, I love the idea of trying to bring this zombie to life um 
And I thought that Jonathan Levine was such a great director and he, he'd written this brilliant script. So I was spending time with him. I was like, it's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge, but it's something that um, I felt like I was like, I think knowing nothing, <laughs> I still felt like, I think maybe you can try and pull this off. And so it was, it was just a fun process of kind of developing these, yeah, this, this sound, I guess, this kind of groaning guttural voice of what R would be in his zombie form. Days passed this way. Myself and Rob Cordry got to go to um, <clears throat> zombie school where we had a Cirque du Soleil kind of um, uh, movement coach come in and for a day or two we would, we would run around like these offices and car parks like pretending to smell flesh and then we'd work on our like zombie different paces of movement and how we reacted to these things um that was the most difficult part that that movie was doing scenes with rob because there'd be scenes where we'd both be sat at like a airport bar but just not saying anything but just improvise improvise groaning at each other but somehow rob cordry managed to make improvise groaning the most hilarious thing in the world and like i'm the worst for giggling on set i can't help it the second and the second i start then i'm like it's like it's it like just captures my my whole being and i'm like just stuck mad max theory road the first x-men film had gained weight and they'd asked me to kind of get musclier and those sorts of things but yeah this was george miller talking to him about the character obviously nux was um supposed to be very sick when you first meet him at the beginning of the movie so he asked me to lose weight he wanted um and obviously they're, they're living in also a post-apocalyptic world where um, he wanted me to look yeah, sick and malnourished and all those things so that was something where yeah for a couple of months or however long it was before shooting I'd just run and jump rope and not eat very much and I think I managed to lose 20 pounds for that film um, which now if I look back and see photos I'm like I didn't notice at the time but if I look back and see photos now I'm like wow yeah I was, I was very skinny for that that film came about with a really brilliant audition process that was kind of the first time I didn't really particularly go to drama school. So suddenly we we're kind of doing all these acting games inside of an audition of observation and things that it went on for four hours. I walked out of the audition. I was like, well, that's unlike any other audition I've ever been in, but I love the process of doing it. And so regardless of whether I get the role or not, I'm excited about what that was and the opportunity to, to work with George in that and then yeah the, the the script for that was i guess i guess it was like a 300 page comic book almost with very little dialogue but each frame of the movie pretty much storyboarded kind of if you hold them up now against the movie that's there it's pretty much shot for shot george had kind of planned everything out exactly as he'd seen it in his incredible imagination and nux was he was a lot of he was a lot of fun to play um because he was a puppy dog and he and he had this great character arc of, of change throughout the story and beliefs and, and his, his relationships with the other characters. It feels like hope. I like this plan. We can start again. And also that environment, being in the desert, surrounded by all these engines, it all really happening around you, just, um, you know, it made for quite an electrifying atmosphere and experience. Emergency! He looked at me! I would get chills on my arms whenever I'd hear they'd kind of give this signal to start everyone's engines up before we'd take off across the desert to start a take and when you hear like all these V8s and V12s and bikes and flamethrowers and everything kind of starting off and there was a great kind of camaraderie between every everyone playing all those war boys as well they would be screaming and shouting and kind of this real it was it was kind of a I mean, cult-like energy or something that was feverish um, to those characters, you know, so it was just feeding on that, I guess. Okay. I was a fan of his work growing up. I, you know, read, I got given The Hobbit to read on the set of About a Boy by, by Chris and Paul, the directors, and, um, and then the films came out not long after that, and I was obsessed with the films. I played the card game, so it was something that was really ingrained in me. The worlds that he'd created but reading the script i realized that i knew very little about the man behind it so i was like this is an incredible life he lived um and story behind behind these stories um, well, really mm. well if tolkien is betraying the brotherhood with a blank i'm going to show you something 
utterly degenerate. <laughs> this cannot be good. It's intimidating playing playing real people because, I mean, it's different, I suppose, if, if you're playing someone from the modern era whoever who's very well known and everyone has kind of seen on TV or whatever it is, and, and then, you, then you kind of have to do an impression to a degree. With, with Tolkien, it was kind of one of those where, yeah, there's videos of him later in life, but there's, there's photos of him when he's younger, but there's no recordings or videos. So it's kind of one of those where that gave me a slight sense of, of relief and also talking to other actors about it. They were like, they were like, don't worry about doing an impression because nobody knows what exactly this character or person was like in that era. So you think it was Michael Shannon said when I was doing a film with him, he said something along the lines of, you know, he's not trying to impersonate the person, he's kind of playing a ghost of them. And I think that's kind of the sense that I was going for with Tolkien that was, it was an essence of just capturing the man at that at that era of his life and what what he was about and what meant a lot to him and, and that was his passion for language and his friends and his loneliness and his escapism and his um yeah his imagination so uh, yeah i thought it was a beautiful script and um obviously yeah intimidating to take on playing a real person particularly someone you're a fan of but um yeah i don't know if 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 roles if i read scripts and i think the roles are easy to play then they're probably not interesting and then then that's not something that I'd want to go and do because it's not going to push me. Favorite. As I'm getting older and the more work I do, I do love being able to transform fully through costume and makeup. Um, and it really gives me a sense of the character, but also that world that I'm stepping into and, and kind of frees me from any semblance of myself inside my head when I'm doing it. So yeah, the costumes for Harley were incredible. Um, um, and working with Sandy and, and the first time trying on, you know, she gave my character these huge high heels, which I'd never really, I don't think too much, walk, walked in high heels before. So that was something where suddenly it changes how, how, how you walk. And then you're kind of having to practice kind of gliding around in these heels as opposed to stomping around and, and twisting an ankle. So um, all those things go into it. And then kind of the jewelry and the cane and, um, Nadia Stacy, the hair and makeup designer, giving me these fantastic wigs that um, you just kind of have to balance on top of your head. And, and it's just all these things that kind of eat, just gradually build up and add up to kind of becoming, becoming a very subtle, small character. <laughs> Horatio is a prize worth stealing. He does not leave my side. Keep him away from me or I will pull his liver out and eat it with a cornichon. Oh, charming. The idea of working with Yorgos, who you know, has, is, is such a singular voice in movie making at the moment, I think. Watching his films, you kind of never quite know the turn they're gonna take or or how they're gonna make you feel. This guy, he's just a, yeah, brilliant filmmaker. Um, so kind of handing over to his process, which again was very different. That was, that was a two week audition process. I mean, two week rehearsal process, not audition. <laughs> that would have been a long time to audition. Two weeks um, rehearsal with the rest of the cast and kind of, I would say, probably actually the most similar experience I've had to Mad Max, where we would play these games to kind of, where we would be dancing and then we'd be doing the scenes, but we'd be doing them whilst we had to do these physical tasks at the same time. And all this stuff that you kind of don't fully understand, you don't fully understand the, what the outcome or what the process is trying to achieve at the time, but then you see it from screen and you kind of go, oh, okay, wow, this is, he's kind of put us all on a rhythm and pace and understanding of what this is, what he is creating. It's very rare as an actor that you're kind of put into a room and everyone's like, okay, now you're gonna dance, now you're gonna do this, now hold hands and get into the biggest tangle you possibly can and someone's got to try and free you and all these things that you're like, we're not sure exactly, but it completely takes away your ego and kind of puts you in this wonderful place of, of playfulness and gives you a freedom to have fun and fail and, and enjoy it, enjoy the process. And the great written by Tony McNamara who wrote The Favourite as well so it's very much um, similar to that in tone it's kind of that kind of dramatic com comedic kind of twist on a period drama this is science enjoy <laughs> and Peter is someone who uh, he's a stream of consciousness he's you know he's he's an emperor of Russia in a time where no one's really saying no to him. It's kind of this microscopic view of the world at that point, I guess, where everyone in the court is trying to manipulate him for their benefit. Um, and he's kind of stuck in the middle. It does, doesn't really want to be a leader. 
is kind of walking in the footsteps or the shadow of his father before him. His mum definitely gave him some psychological scarring. So he's a little bit twisted from that. Um, and he's, yeah, he's, he's obnoxious. He's rude. He's sometimes endearing. He's a, a child, basically. Um, uh, but a very, very fun character to play. I haven't done a series since, since Skin. So to get to play a character over, you know, 10 hours is um is a lot of fun because then you can really kind of embed yourself in them kind of get to grips with them understand them but then completely reverse and change and evolve them throughout throughout the process of of the filming